Hello, my name is Claire and I believe that if you want to beat Breath of the Wild on true canonical hero mode difficulty, it's by beating Ganon with a mop. Yeah, tell me the wielder of the Triforce of Power didn't see that one coming. <laughs> but that's just the thing, isn't it? By doing this, are we just trolling Nintendo and insulting their beautiful game by insisting that we carry a chicken from one side of Hyrule to the other just to see if we can, what, annoy the final boss with it? Does our ability to do this mean that we're playing Breath of the Wild incorrectly? Let's find out. And I assure you, no chickens were harmed in the making of this video. Since its release in 2017, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild has quickly earned its place among the series' most important entries. And coming from a crazy Zelda fan child like myself, that is not said lightly. It's the reason you bought a Switch, the reason Link is even sexier than ever, and the reason Zelda sold to gamers and non-gamers alike in a move parallel to the Animal Crossing pandemic. And I mean, come on, you only need to taste the game to see the brilliance behind its design, the passion that drove its originality, and the plain addictiveness of its open gameplay. And with Breath of the Wild 2 on the horizon, thank god, finally, what better time to give a bit of thought into the deliberateness of its game design, and just exactly what makes the first one so damn good? And the answer to that is, strangely, in our ability to face Ganon with a mop. Hidemaru Fujibayashi, the director for Breath of the Wild, famously noted that it was the team's first intention to break conventions. Now, us gamers are pretty smart people, and we know a marketing ploy when we see one. But remarkably, Nintendo not only took this meaning very seriously, but risked their most important series to show us exactly how this could be done. And at first, diehard Zelda fans like myself were reluctant to see Link pulled from the linear, dungeon-crawling stories we grew up with and thrown into an open-world survival stick-breaking simulator. But ultimately, Breath of the Wild is proof that Nintendo's vision for taking the series in a whole new direction was not only a bold one, but a bloody brilliant one too. I won! The key to their success is in player freedom, and I don't just mean the freedom to move around or bash chickens. I'm talking about the limitless ways we can play Breath of the Wild. Before I get into exactly how it achieves this freedom, you need to know that when game systems are designed and worlds are constructed, there must be barriers in place. Limitations that are believable to the player so that we can safely and enjoyably play within the set parameters of the system. Because games are finite, right? But here's where things get interesting, where Nintendo has taken these barriers and actually redefined find them to establish endless gameplay possibilities. Let's start with walls. Obvious barriers, yeah. Basically, any video game's way of saying, look, just, just don't. But because Breath of the Wild Link has apparently been pumped with some serious juice muscle, suddenly every cliffside, tree, and vertical surface is now climbable. Even though we have the limitations of the stamina meter, which I often learnt the hard way, here we have a barrier transformed with a simple movement mechanic into a traversable space. With our possibilities for movement multiplied by a tenfold, the limitations for where we can go is significantly reduced, and Hyrule just opens to us. Full of space, of freedom, of possibilities. And brutal murder, apparently. The buzzwords Nintendo were going for here involved the shift from passive to active gameplay. This meant that they wanted to take a passive formula of getting through the game in conventional ways with conventional barriers and transform it into an active experience filled with endless ways to reach a certain goal. So if you're like me and decided that spending two solid hours rolling a boulder from one side of Hyrule to another just to see if it was possible was worth it, then you'll be pleased to know that Fujibayashi himself totally encourages it. This is known as emergent behavior, where systems designed in simple ways give room for surprisingly complex ways to play, especially when we tend to engage with the world in ways the devs might not have even intended. Like that time I made a seesaw launcher, went shield surfing down Lanayru Mountain, destroyed every Korok that crossed my path, yeah you know what you did, or decided to just see how far I could take Link across the seas. Uh, that wasn't wasn't one of my brightest moments. But while I discovered new and exciting ways to torture Linky Poo, every single one of my sadistic actions were absolutely acceptable because I was allowed to experiment with the rules of the world to come up with new and interesting ways to play. In fact, Nintendo wants us to test just how far we can push their systems to accommodate our freedom, to come up with ridiculous, stupid solutions to puzzles just because we can. In Breath of the Wild, let's face it, we probably spend more time playing the game in ways we shouldn't, but that's exactly 
exactly what makes its design so remarkable. And when we keep messing around with it only to find that one of our crazy solutions actually works, heck, how cool does that feel? Notes from the International Conference on Entertainment Computing put across that video games with emergent gameplay systems need two things to prevent their systems from well, freaking out, while at the same time not sacrificing player freedom. That is consistency and intuitive design. The first bit, consistency, means that the rules we encounter here are the exact same as what we encounter there. How frustrating is it when a solution that works in this case, for some reason, just doesn't work in that? When object physics suddenly make no sense and walls just decide to smoosh with our face? Gameplay systems must achieve consistency for us to find the world believable and navigable. And most importantly, to stay immersed and essentially forget that we're interacting with nicely assembled vectors and codes. With consistent systems established, we can begin to feel comfortable within them, familiar with what we can do and trusting in the system that makes it happen. But even though we do need to learn these rules over time, the laws, especially of free roam games, must be intuitive. This means that there is a degree of inherent understanding brought in from the player, a real life application to the virtual world. Water puts out fire, if this cube can be carried around, it obviously needs to be taken over here to activate this, you know, the basic stuff that we just no. With both consistent and intuitive gameplay design, Breath of the Wild presents a simple roadmap. There is a goal and a solution to achieving that goal, but the in-between is entirely up to us. In the wondrous words of Fujibayashi, the user is able to think for themselves and create a path forward. But what exactly is that mysterious in-between space? And how do we even begin to approach it in ways that are consistent with the laws of the game and also intuitive to real life? I really love how Takuhiro Dota, lead programmer and technical director for Breath of the Wild cheekily defines video game physics as a lie. <laughs> when you think about it, playing an entirely virtual space constructed with programming parameters and physics engines, every single reaction from the world is basically fake presenting the illusion of a living space. To the design team, the rules of the runes are essentially lies based on real life physics. Halting objects with stasis uses an application of kinetic energy principles. Magnesis uses simple magnetic laws to move metal only items. Even Cryonis is all about using the mass in frozen water as physical platforms or to push up doors. Everything from smashing mini guardians in the face with a metal cube to taking a ride on a soaring energy filled rock just cause we can is us playing with the parameters of these fake rules. In doing this, we engage with Breath of the Wild's inbuilt rule-based movement calculator, which Dota labels as the physics of the game. But what about a rule-based state calculator? Well, that's the chemistry side of things. The basic principles of elemental interactions, how objects respond to rain, fire, lightning, mother of and how their states can be changed as a result. Lighting bogoblins on fire, using metal to bring fury from above, causing a fire on the grass, which creates an updraft on which we can fly on. It's simply incredible how these in-game laws have been utilized by the design team to multiply the possibilities of making it from here to there. This is what the team refers to as multiplicative gameplay. Multiplicative gameplay, in short, is using multiplication to expand gameplay. This is done by building connections between everything in the world, ensuring that our actions have effects that ripple through multiple possibilities. The possibilities of fire and the different ways we can utilize it, the possibilities of moving metal objects around. Whatever chemical or physical element you want to manipulate for your own sadistic pleasure, virtually anything is possible in Breath of the Wild system because it is both consistent and feels instinctive. If you unify your game world with a set of consistent physics rules, the player will come up with ideas for all sorts of things they want to try. When so many chemical and physical possibilities are presented to us, Breath of the Wild doesn't just become interactive, but experimental. These guys don't just get excited about the possibilities for a game designer, but the possibilities for a player. Consider your own playthrough. What is the craziest way you have achieved something? Did you make use of bombs to crush enemies with falling trees, or use those logs to cross a river that time? Bloody heck, I've screwed up over five playthroughs and 200 plus hours and I'm still discovering new ways to play that I legit never knew were possible. I mean, half the fun of this game is discovering how the Zelda community have also exploited player freedom. For instance, while you can argue that every shrine has a general solution intended by the developers for us to figure out, the nature of Breath of the Wild's beautiful gameplay means that we can theoretically solve them in any way we want, granted that we stay within the rules of the system. Take Game Champs completion run where they challenge themselves to beat the game without even 
opening their inventory. When they were unable to access the runes that would normally be used to solve these puzzles, they instead had to literally improvise and utilize any trick they had up their sleeve. And amazingly, 95% of the time, these crazy solutions actually worked. It just goes to show that in Breath of the Wild, the sky really is the limit. And as long as we have a basic grasp of the physical rules, we can truly make our playthroughs our own. With Breath of the Wild 2 on the way, I have no doubts that Nintendo are going to expand on these possibilities and see just how far their systems can take our stupidity, our curiosity, and our passion for pushing our favorite virtual worlds to their limits. Because the fact is that Breath of the Wild is more than just an open world RPG-esque venture into an expanded genre, it's an intuitively designed, wondrously multiplicative piece of media that absolutely challenges how far games can go to accommodate our wildest imaginings. So what can we expect from number two? Well, expanding on the notion of player freedom to see just how far physics and chemistry can be altered and manipulated to allow for even more intuitive problem solving would be a good start. I mean, if there's one thing I can guarantee for sure, it's that Nintendo know the impact Breath of the Wild has had on the gaming industry and the importance of continuing to push the boundaries of what interactive entertainment can achieve. And if they're the passionate boundary breaking innovators we know and love them for being, it's pretty safe to say that we can expect extraordinary things from the Zelda series for many years to come. Oh, very nice, very nice, yes, 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 queen. Oh, I fucking love this game. As always, thank you so much for sitting through this video. I'm sure all of us shed a tear when we finally saw the trailer of Breath of the Wild 2 Land. And I thought this would be a really great time to give a little bit more insight into the development process behind Breath of the Wild and just how clever Nintendo is and how passionate they are in making sure that the games that they make reflect not only what the developers want, but of course what the players want in a game. Of course, if there are any topics you'd be interested in me covering, don't forget to comment down. Also, I'd love to hear your own experiences in playing Breath of the Wild and any ridiculous, crazy stuff that you got up to and solving solutions. Also, if you like this stuff, subscribe. That would be really great. <laughs> Otherwise, I've just started my eighth playthrough of Breath of the Wild, so I'm gonna go collect all 900 Korok seeds because I hate myself. <laughs> Bye. So I'll never forget my first playthrough of Breath of the Wild. Um, I was still getting familiar with the armor equipping mechanic and don't ask me why for the start of the game, I decided that Link wouldn't be wearing any armor, namely on his chest. <laughs> so I was basically wandering around the first like solid couple of hours of the game. Like I reached the first divine beast um, and I was just getting KO'd really easily. And it took me a while to realize why. And I learned, I learned, I learned why. There we go. Wear a shirt <laughs> is the moral of the story. And, and don't be a horny bish like me. <laughs> That's another moral to learn. <laughs>